This is Twit. This week, I want to talk about a big feature that I you know, came out with a couple of days ago, and I was basically one of the only reporters to go inside the New York headquarters of a big Neuralink competitor. So if you know, Neuralink is Elon Musk's brain implant company. Um, and so there are actually a lot of other companies, and this one's called Synchron, and it is, um, I believe, a little further ahead of Neuralink. So its implant is in 10 people, and Neuralink is in seven. So um, yeah, just really fascinating look at like how implants work and like the fact that maybe we'll all get one someday. And it was just very mind blowing. Mind blowing. Very good. Very good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm curious to hear. I think sometimes something that gets missed because it's been my experience that journalists who are very focused on the journalism, which is a good thing. But because of that, they end up being a little bit um, uh, sort of not coy per se, but uh, they they don't want to talk about themselves and like the experience of it. And so this is where I get to go. You went into this place and you were the only journalist to get to do that. Like what what was that like going in? What, how did they, did they give you a tour? I mean, were you able to look at different, you know, models of, of, did you get to talk with any, those are the kinds of things I think are really fascinating that we sometimes miss, um, in, in these stories. Sure. Yeah. So I can't even go a step back. So they contacted me after I wrote an article about how Apple is enabling people with their implant to control iPads and iPhones. So it's basically a Bluetooth connection that Apple has built for all called brain computer interfaces, BCIs. So for all BCIs and this company, Synchron is the first one to do it. So people who have the implant can, you know, Bluetooth connect to Apple devices and poke around on them with their thoughts. So I wrote an article Uh about that. They contacted me and I was like, oh, I'm located in the New York area. Like I'd love to come meet you guys. And they were just like, sure. And we just, turns out, I don't know if many journalists have even asked that question, Um, but it was really interesting because they don't post their address publicly and Uh, they kind of like had to get clearance internally to to get somebody to send me an email with the address. And then they gave me the address, but then I got there in Brooklyn and I was wandering around for like 15, 20 minutes in this big area of all kinds of like wacky startups or like smokestacks and there was a, a steel door with 10 locks all around the door and also 10 handles. <laughs> like, wow. <what? laughs> so I was just like, what is this place? And I'm like looking around for this like brain implant startup. And then I just happened to walk into one of the buildings that kind of looked like it might have a security guard. And then my colleague, our photographer was there already. So I guess he picked the same building. And then also serendipitously, a Synchron employee was in the lobby, like going up to work. And she's like, oh, yeah, I'll take you guys up. And on the way up, she she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, they don't really give out the address. And oh, yeah, did you notice like the visitor's pass email actually has two other addresses that are inaccurate at the bottom, like for a different part of Brooklyn. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, just goodness, you just chose like, the right one. Right. Like, I think I ignored those, but it was just a very mysterious experience. And then we got to the top of the elevator. We went inside. Um, it looked like kind of startup y, like, you know, trendy plants and open kitchen. We could hear people like making a, like, cleaning dishes and stuff. There was open desks and then like a big floor to ceiling windows overlooking Manhattan. And we just kind of like sat on this leather couch right next to a giant brain model and just waited for them to come and grab us. And then we basically went into the CEO's office. We talked to him. Then we had a demo of the tech from the COO. Um, and then we just kind of like talked to some employees. We pet their adorable golden retriever. Who's <laughs> so innocent compared to the topic of brain implants for poor little guy. Oh, you mean the, the retriever didn't have a brain implant? I know. I was looking at him like, oh, <laughs> do they implant Can you, you work with an iPad? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. So that was it. Yeah. That was kind of like the experiential aspect. The, and I mean, this is still just I mean, you you said kind of mind blowing, mind boggling. It is all of these things uh, in terms of of you know forming this connection. Did in in your time kind of working with them and talking to them? I mean, um, did they discuss the realistic 
state of the technology. I think that, yeah, the especially whenever you're working with a company that, on the other hand, is uh, a Musk company, you get these sort of grandiose uh, proclamations and you have to take those things with a grain of salt. Is there, m- did you find that this, there was more realism here or is it still kind of in that vein of, of uh, tech optimism that borders on perhaps idealism? What was yes, that you're experience asking like? such great questions. So <laughs> the CEO was more realistic and he brought up real issues with, you know, if everybody had a brain implant, which by the way, he expects to make kids available to anyone by the 2040s. And so if anyone could have a brain implant, um, what would that mean? Like, would that give the company who makes them too much control over your literal thoughts and actions and like what you're doing on these tech devices? And so he was open to discussing things like um, bias, discrimination, even like subversive control, like evil companies. Like he was willing to talk about these ethical issues, which is what I'm interested in. So I, I like that. Um, also comes from a medical background. So he was very interested in just he hype, I guess hype. Yeah, he hyped their their implantation method quite a bit because it doesn't actually drill into the skull like Neuralink. It mm. inserts like a little snake up your body through a vein up to top of your brain. So it sits at the top of your brain in a large vein that um, is, I guess, close enough to get the right electrical signal. So we talked a lot about that. And then there was, I thought the COO was a little more of like a sales guy and he his confidence was dripping from the walls. He was like, there's no way it's not going to work. Like we think Neuralink is over-engineering. I, I could not get wow. him to crack. Like I tried to poke so many holes, but he, he like really is selling the thing. So it, the confidence levels were very high, but, um, I did interview a patient after, and I also interviewed a Neuralink patient and I could compare them. And the Neuralink one is a little more powerful but it does have that trade-off of it's extremely invasive and it's drilling into your skull and putting it on the brain. So it depends who the patient is, like how much they need. And I do agree with Synchron that probably the least invasive thing typically wins out in medicine. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the with, with laparoscopic surgeries and things like that, uh, overtaking in as many cases as possible, the more complicated ones. I mean, it, that, it's mm-hmm. often a cost-saving metric, if nothing else. And we know that if there's one thing the healthcare industry cares about, it's saving money. So right. I'm not surprised to hear that in that way, you kind of are going, oh, we may have found a gold mine here, at least a vein of gold here. Um, <laughs> a gold one vein? Of the, oh, a gold vein. Uh, one of the other aspects of this that I was curious about, you said um, Neuralink is more powerful. When you mm-hmm. say that, is that according to the two patients that you interviewed and from your own um, understanding of what each could do, you've determined that Neuralink is more powerful? Is that even what the companies say, that Neuralink is more powerful because it has a more direct connection? Kind of where did that more mm-hmm. powerful come from? And then also in that, what does it mean in terms of being more powerful? Yeah. So that does come from the company itself. So their main technical challenge is achieving the same performance as Neuralink because Ah, they're just one layer removed physically, like a tissue layer above. Um, And then I formed my own opinion just by talking to the two patients. So the first one, this is guy Rodney in Australia. He has a, a a Synchron implant. He can't talk or move. So he uses his implant to control um, devices, but he can't control the mouse. So he has to use eye tracking. And then once his eyes fall and what he wants to press, he uses his implant to select it. And the Uh way he does that, which is really crazy, is he kind of, they program the, how do I even put this? Like they almost make it like a hotkey. So when he wants to press select, he thinks, move my foot. So that's his, got it. That's his signal. It's like they could, it could be like, uh, move my pinky. It could be right. like scratch my back. I don't know. It could be just like another, it's related to a body part. And so their yeah. brain sends signals. So it's almost like a hot key, like a shortcut <laughs> that you program. Yeah. So his is move my foot for select. So he can like, you know, browse news articles. He can send texts, but he has to, you know, like move his eye to the, to the letter and select it. So the Neuralink patient, um, who is a younger guy and does not have a degenerative disease. He was paralyzed. Um, after a diving accident, which is really unfortunate. So he's 31. 
he can't move, but he can speak. So he can dictate, which is really helpful. And then with his Neuralink, he can also move the cursor, which is a huge benefit. You don't have to use eye tracking, which is exhausting. And then he too has his like aspects of his body that are programmed to, to take actions. Does that make Understood. sense? So it's yeah, absolutely. No, that makes yeah, perfect sense. Yeah, it's different you, things, different inputs, like eye tracking, dictation. Um, but then both of them had the same thing. When they want to use their implant, they have to think about a body part. Yeah, I'm sure that in when you're looking at signals that your brain sends, there are probably ones that are easier to discover and and separate from exactly. the pack. Everyone and has something. good and bad ones, and depending yeah. on if you have a disease that's affected a certain part of your brain or you don't have a disease or just just your own biology so it's super hands-on with the companies like Neuralink and Synchron have worked with these patients to program their pathways and they're always optimizing them um and yeah just really tiny like single digits people have these implants and you know none of them are available on the market they're not FDA approved so this is really kind of like a renegade behind the scenes thing that's a very very active space which is what I learned now, there's one part uh, in your article of a photograph of a silver briefcase with foam on the inside, very spy moment, which is really kind of uh, neat. When, how do they, obviously they're operating in New York, right? But are they implanting in the U.S.? Do they have to do? Is there a reason why the guy came from Australia as opposed to like what's hmm. what's that part of it? Do you know the Australian connection? I'm guessing is that the CEO is Australian, and there are like uh. universities there and just activities. I mean, I don't know exactly how he was selected, but there there is a connection there. So he's. Australian. He came to the U.S. at a pretty young age and found that the U.S. had more research funding for this area, and he thought it was very commendable. And he was able to connect with someone actually in the army and kind of discuss his idea. And it's kind of grown from there. So I'm not sure if that Australian patient came to the U.S. or what, but that's the Australia connection. It's not like just any country anywhere. Understood. Um, anything else that stuck out to you? Uh, or that you know you think is is uh, something of interest mm -hmm. in this that you want to mention before we head into a break. Yeah, I think just one last thing is we we think of this space as kind of for people with disabilities, and it very much is at this point. But to be clear, like the ambition for all these companies is to make it for everybody, and you can see that the writing is on the wall a little bit. Maybe in like fifty, a hundred years, you know, think about. We've gone from cell phones, which are kind of annoying and cumbersome to use, right? We're like hunched over, we're getting carpal tunnel. Like that's not the best experience possible. So now people are going to glasses like, oh, you can, you can sit up, you can talk to an AI. You know, we're experimenting with these different form factors. So the ultimate seamless form factor but that would give you the best posture is probably a brain implant. So it's like, you could see how the trend is going there. And then with Apple exploring them, NVIDIA is also partnering with Synchron to train AIs on brain waves, which is crazy. So it's very long term, but I left with an impression that this um, there would be appetite for this if it worked properly and that very powerful people and companies are wanting to go in that direction. Understood. Yeah. Uh, I We look at the accessibility features on... Uh, in our tech already. And many of those features that first existed as accessibility only features end up working their way into everybody using totally. them. And in some cases, you know, there are features in that portion that people use regularly. And so I'm not surprised that this is another place where, you know, it could be open to, to everybody eventually. So very cool. Everyone should, of course, head over uh, to read the article. We'll link it in the show notes.